last week was, do you consider yourself wise? What could you change to become more wise? <sighs> what do you guys think? I consider myself wise in some areas. Like you love cooking, for instance. Okay. I, I, I think I can learn a lot more, but I think I, I know a lot to begin with. So are you talking more about knowledge? Knowledge of cooking, yeah. Wisdom, I think, or, more applies to um, knowing um, how to respond in moral situations or to know how to be tactful in a situation, that kind of stuff. Um, so cooking knowledge is a, is a thing, obviously, but I don't think it qualifies quite as wisdom. wisdom. I don't. Uh, any other ideas? I don't consider myself wise that... Uh, That there's things that there's your that I'm always learning new stuff every day. Right. Okay. There's just no way to be. Right, but does that make you not wise though? Well, Could you still be wise and learn? Yeah. You can, but so. I just never really thought, you know, to be so that I'm, you know, wise. To so that I don't get a a head strong. Okay. And be prideful. I got you. Any, idea, any other ideas? You think? Do you consider yourself wise? I think as a Christian, I mean, if you take him from a Christian perspective, uh, comparing ourselves to the world, I think um, in wisdom, I think. I, I, I think we're more wise because we're, we're relying on God's wisdom. Uh-huh. And, um, I mean, we, we change, we, what, what I do to change more, I think as time goes by, you, you grow more in wisdom. You right. know, it's not like an overnight thing. That's, um, okay. Did you have any ideas? No? Um, did anybody want coffee? I'm good, thank you. Okay. So, what could you change to become more wise then? Prayer. Okay. Staying in the Word. Okay. And, um. Try not to be prideful. Patience. Okay. Trying not to be prideful, okay. Listen to what other people tell you. Okay. Yes. Listen to, listen uh, from your elders. Okay. Or listen and watch. Okay, anything else? Very good. Mm -hmm. Anything else? And be able to and teach others what you know. Uh huh. Okay. Like, like to turn around. Okay. How do you think this relates to what Paul said about um, the wisdom of the world and verse or the, the the foolishness of God versus the wisdom of the world? How do you think that relates? Or do you not know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, Paul writes, and he says that to the world, um, our salvation in Christ is foolishness. And then he says it seems to contradict the world's wisdom. Right. So what do you think that has to do with what we're talking about here? Does anybody else want some of these? Because I'm eating them all. I think uh, from the world's perspective, when the Bible talks about uh, the world consider themselves wise, is because they rely on their own understanding and they think they know it all. Mm -hmm. Yes. God says, you know, that that um, the mind will fool you. 
you know, uh -huh. just considering yourself wise, you're yeah. already being fooled. Yeah. Um, Diana, you are so far on on point that it hurts. Exactly what Diana just yeah. said. What way we looked at look at last week with Proverbs. Uh -huh. Just exactly, exactly right, Diana. I yes, absolutely. We were talking about how I just yes, gold star for Diana. Uh, we were talking. <laughs> <laughs> <We're> <laughs> now, we were talking about last week with Proverbs, and I just brain farted. So I <laughs> forgot what we were talking about. <laughs> it's been a long day, guys. Um, we were talking about... Um, Couple guys doing wisdom. Just want to know. Yeah. But we were just talking about... Okay, right, right. The wisdom of God, right. Oh my gosh. Okay, well, we're talking, looking about in, in Proverbs about how he says in chapter I think it's like what was it three or four or something? And he says, "Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your understanding." That's exactly what he was talking about. What Diana just said is exactly what he's talking about. And uh, so, absolutely. I mean, we, we talked about it, but it's that's exactly how it would apply. That as we learn in wisdom, we reach this place of thinking that we know everything. And uh, you know, not being able to. Where am I going? Not being able to uh, to be taught things. Not being able to to uh, stay humble, like Zach was saying. Uh, can you give me a word that? Um, and uh, absolutely. Let's see, where was that at? I think it's three. Yeah, three uh, five. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your understanding. He just got done telling you about. About all these things about wisdom, and then right in the middle of all that, he says, "Now hold up, though, you're not going to be smart in and of yourself. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make you straight. Make straight your paths." So, awesome, awesome, awesome. <clears throat> so, just a summary of what we looked at. The first message was in chapter one, verses eight through nine, and it was listen to your parents. The second message was to say no to to immorality. Thank you. A uh, little, you're kind of turn to liquid, huh? Uh, can I have uh, that syrup, that chocolate syrup stuff? Because I feel like ice cream without chocolate syrup is a little bit of a disappointment. <laughs> I mean, who's with me? Chocolate makes everything better, right? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> um, then the third message was not to reject wisdom. The fourth message was to seek wisdom. And it was in chapter two. It was the whole chapter. Um, the fifth message was the characteristics of wisdom, and that was the whole chapter once again. Then we looked at – last week we closed off with the sixth message, which was um, that, that, wi that wisdom is like a family treasure and how it's supposed to be treated and whatnot, right? So uh, we'll go ahead and read part of that now to just kind of remind you um, what we were looking at. Chapter 4 starts up. Okay, thank you. Here are sons uh, a father's instruction and be attentive that you may gain insight. For I give you good precepts. Do not forsake my teaching. When I was a son with my father, tender, the only one in the sight of my mother, he taught me and said to me, Let your heart hold fast my words. Keep my commandments and live. Get wisdom, get insight, do not forget, and do not turn away from the words of my mouth. He's talking about a conversation that he and his dad had, him and, and King David. Um, and then that goes on through verse 9. And then in verse 10 he picks up with, with Solomon talking, Hear my son and accept my words that the years of your life may be many. I have taught you the way of wisdom. I have led you in the paths of uprightness. When you walk, your step will not be hampered. And if you run, you will not stumble. I've taught you these good things that are going to help you in the way that you're going. Um, keep hold of instruction. Do not let go. Guard her, for she is your life. Now, let me just stop here real quick. There's this idea. There's this idea that our house is collapsing, y'all. I, I know. There's like weird things going on. <laughs> um, Sorry. Uh, oh, the ears are <laughs> And now I lost my train of thought. Uh, um, Go back on recording. Right? Oh my gosh, guys. Um, man, I totally forgot what I was saying. When you walk, your step will not be hampered. If you run, you will not stumble. Keep hold of instruction. You're like a word of your life. Something I was gonna say something about the way that um, oh yes people people say something along the lines of this oh well I go my way and God blesses it that's not what he's saying here because you are either going your way or you're going God's way so if you're going your way and expecting God to bless it you're already wrong yeah, right. see what I mean and people mistake what he's saying here he's not saying 
So whichever way you decide to go, God's just going to bless you and you're just going to go live your life. <laughs> but you're going to choose to go the way of, uh, way of God, and God's going to bless you in that. So it'll be in the way that you go, which is the way towards God. <laughs> See, he's not saying he's not saying you get out of jail free card. All right. Uh, okay. So then, let me just boop, and then boop. Next is the seventh message, um, which is in the middle of the sixth message. Because if you look on the sixth message here, I'll go back. See how it goes one through th verses one through thirteen, yeah. and then again twenty through twenty-seven. Yeah. Well, in the middle of that is the seventh message, which oh. is. Choose life. Verses 14 through 19. Do not enter the path of the wicked and do not walk in the way of the evil. Avoid it. Do not go in on it. Uh, turn away from it and pass on, for they cannot sleep unless they have done wrong. They are robbed of sleep unless they have made someone stumble. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. But the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. The way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know over what they stumble. Now, there's really a lot of stuff going on here, so I'm going to try and break it down because there's there's these verses are just packed, just packed, okay? So let's look at the first thing first. Don't do evil, and if you do, turn from it. Look in verses 14 through 15. Do not enter the path of the wicked. Do not walk in the way of the, way of the evil. Avoid it. Do not go on it. Turn away from it and pass on. Right. Now, how could you turn away from it if you weren't on it? Right. So what he's saying is don't do evil, but if you do do evil, turn away from it. Now, why is that important? Because people say something along the lines of this, right? They say, you know, this is just who I am. I can't change. God can't reach me where I'm at. You know, I'm just too far gone. God can't God can't change me. That's not what he just said there. He said, if you are on that bad path, turn away from it. Ver the end of verse 15. Turn away from it and pass on. So, um, then the second thing here. Evil spreads and causes more evil. Look at verse 16. For they cannot sleep unless they have done wrong. They are robbed of sleep unless they have made someone stumble. Well, they're already wicked. They're already doing bad things. But then their heart is constantly conniving. They're constantly thinking about what more they can do. See what I mean? So Nobody that, ever. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So that they can't sleep. Right, right. Uh, nobody has ever stolen something and then said, you know what? Or, you know, when they, when they pull off those big heists like you see on TV. Oh, yeah. They don't ever just organize this thing and, and do this big robbery and then think, you know what, we're good. They plan another one. Uh -huh. See, I mean, like, there's there's always one more job to pull. There's always one more mark. There's always one more thing to steal. That's because evil spreads. The more you give yourself up to the lust and the passions of the flesh, the more you're not going to have to give yourself up to the lust and the passions of the flesh. It's a consuming thing. If you, for instance, give yourself over to adultery, you're going to keep on cheating. If you give yourself over to over to stealing, you're going to keep on stealing. If you give yourself over to pride, you're going to keep being – see what I mean? Yeah. It's like pastor says it like this, and I think he just said it last week or the week before. The same pride that gets us into a problem keeps us in the problem. Well, why is that? Because what he just said here. Yeah. See, we get prideful and we say, oh, I'm not going to go apologize. And then even if we realize that we're wrong, we're not going to go back and apologize. Uh -huh. Even though our, our attitude has changed and we're not mad about it anymore, our pride is keeping us from repenting. See what I mean? The same sin that gets us into something is the same sin that holds us there. So, evil spreads and always causes more evil. Evil is binding. And you know the thing about this is it's very important to note because Hollywood spins it differently. Oh, yeah. Oh, you can do something wrong and still be a good person. No, you can't. As you seek after the lust of the flesh, you change. You just change. And then evil is binding, blinding, and consuming. Look at verses 17 and 19. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. What is the thing that keeps them alive? What is their food? Bread of wickedness. Wickedness is what they feast on. It's an all-consuming thing. It's binding to them, and it's blinding because they can't see that they're so dependent on it. But it is also consuming in that the more that they eat the bread of wickedness, the more they need the bread of wickedness. And then look what it says, and drink the wine of violence. What is alcohol known to do? Right? It cheers our spirits, and then we conk out if we keep drinking, right? So that's what he compares it to here. Drink the wine of violence. He's not talking about actual physical wine. He's talking about violence. The wine of violence. So at first it seems really good. It mixes in good spirits. And then it all goes downhill. <laughs> See what I mean? He compared it to wine for a reason. Uh, in verse uh, 19, can I get you anything like a pillow or something? Okay. In verse 19, the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know over what they stumble. See, it blinds them. 
Jesus said it like this, because you think you can see, you can't see. Because you think you have sight, you are blind. And that kind of what, what, what going along with what Diana already said, though. Um, so the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. It's something that they, they can't see what's in front of them. They can't see what happens next. Wisdom is all about being tactful. I'm going to respond with wisdom so that my relationship with this person won't be harmed. I'm going to respond with wisdom so that God will be benefited in the long run, right? But wickedness doesn't see like that. Wickedness sees right in front of itself. It's like deep darkness. They can't see what's in front of them. See the difference? The righteous person is able to weigh out their steps before them. The wicked person is blinded to the very actions that they're doing. See what I mean? So, um, they do not know over what they stumble. You see this in, with guys in prison all the time. You know, it wasn't my fault. I was framed. You know, all this nonsense. Okay. All right. Somebody else's right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. They don't know what they stumble on. Grace, you made me do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she did. I saw Okay, so, verses 18, if you look at this, righteousness grows, affects others, and brings clarity and alertness. Let's take this apart. In verse 18, the path of the righteous, or the way of righteousness, is like the light of dawn, okay, which shines brighter and brighter into a full day. What's the imagery there? It's something where the more you walk in righteousness, the better it gets. The more you walk in righteousness, the more you change. The more you walk in righteousness, the more you can see. Whereas the wicked person is blinded to the things right in front of them. The righteous person keeps growing in that righteousness until they can see what's in front of them. See what I mean? It's the opposite effect. Now, notice how with righteousness, it's a growing thing. It's like the day that gets brighter. But notice how with wickedness, it's not something that grows. It is as the deepest darkness. See the difference there? The righteousness, there's hope for a future. The righteousness, you're moving in a forward direction. But the wickedness, there was no hope of a change. It was deep darkness. So then uh, we see that it grows like the light does. We see that it affects others. But the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. Light doesn't just shine on itself, does it? It shines for everyone to see. See what I mean? The righteous person is able to affect others positively, but the wicked person doesn't even know what they stumble over for themselves. Mm -hmm. See the difference there? And then, uh, it, obviously, the light also brings clarity and alertness. The idea that in darkness, what happens? People sleep in darkness, right? Mm -hmm. But in light, people are awake. They go to work. They, you know, they're alert. So it brings clarity and alertness. Well, I don't want to get too far off on this, but, but it's obvious here that there's a contrast. It ha it's highlighting um, two things that are opposites. Remember I said about this? When you're contrasting two characters, you contrast the things that are different. So if this is true of the wicked person, we know that the opposite of true is true of the righteous person, right? So, for they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence, so we know then, therefore, that the righteous people don't partake of, of violence. We know that they keep their hands from it, right? Uh -huh. And then he goes on to say, but the path of righteousness is like the light of dawn. Um, so, so evil brings instant results and leads to even worse results. Wisdom is a process. The thing, the thing that gets people with wisdom is it's something that you seek God... And it takes time. You gradually change. Just like when you're saved, you're not all of a sudden perfect, this perfect Christian. You change, and you're, and, you're, and you're molded by the Holy Spirit. Whereas wickedness, there's no hope of that process. Evil brings instant results. You instantly start to feel different. You start to think different. And then it leads to even worse results. There's no hope of a, of a better change in the future. So, um, any questions on the seventh message? And that takes us to the eighth message, which is in chapter five. I believe it's the whole chapter. No, it is not. It is not the whole chapter. Now, chapter five deals with um, mostly adultery, but the first part talks about more than just adultery, and the second part kind of just focuses on, on adultery. So the first part is sin is enticing. My son, be attentive to my wisdom, incline your ear to my understanding, that you may keep discretion, and your lips may guard knowledge. Now, we already talked about discretion, and we already talked about that. But notice how he says that, incline your ear to my understanding, okay, that you may keep discretion, and your lips may guard knowledge. Wisdom should be affecting our mouth, okay? For the lips of a forbidden woman drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil. 
Now, who's the forbidden woman? That's adultery, right? Yes. But this is going to be something that applies to more than just adultery, right? Right? Think of it like this. With adultery, you're taking something that doesn't belong to you, right? Because your spouse has said, I am yours. And then you go and say, I want this one. Uh -huh. Zach, you're not a girl, and Nicole, you're not married, so I'm going to use Diana as my example. Gracie is my wife, right? She has bound herself to me. Diana is Joe's wife. She has bound herself to Joe. So then adultery is saying, me want cookie. Uh -huh. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Taking something that isn't yours. See what I mean? And so the principle of adultery stretches past just adultery, doesn't it? It goes into other areas like cheating in general, cheating on the taxes. It's tax season, guys. Yeah. And cheating on, you know, uh, your tithes or whatever. You know, you're cheating. Okay, it's the same same kind of idea. And in this, yes, the, the forbidden woman is ad adultery, but also it, it goes to sin more broadly too. For the lips of a forbidden woman drip honey. And her speech is smoother than oil. But at the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps follow the path to shale. She does not ponder the path to life. Her ways to wander, and she does not know it. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, her ways wander, and she does not know it. Now, let me just stop here real quick and just say this. There is no such thing as I was overcome and couldn't control myself. <laughs> you can always say no. <laughs> okay? That's what the Bible actually says. There's never going to be a situation when you're in temptation that it is physically impossible for you to say no. He, the Bible does not say that we won't get more than we can handle. It says with temptation, there will never be the situation where you were forced to sin. Right. You always have the choice of whether or not to sin. Right. Okay? And adultery is the exact same way. It, was, it just happened. No, you chose, you chose to do it. Uh -huh. That's as lame as somebody cl uh, claiming that they raped somebody because the other person was asking for it. No. You wanted it, and so you took it. Like It's not something that we need to be excusing here. Verse 7. And now, O sons, listen to me, and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her. Do not go near the door to her house, lest you give your, give your honor to others and your years to the, to the merciless, merciless, lest strangers take their fill of your strength, and your laborers go to the house of a foreigner. And at the end of your life you groan when your flesh and body are consumed, and you say, How I hated discipline! And my heart despised reproof. I did not listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ear to instructors. I am at the brink of utter ruin in the assembled congregation. And that's the whole eighth message. So let's look at it in parts. The first off is that sin gives immediate pleasure. There's this idea a lot of times in Christianity that sin is not fun. Sin is very fun. Look at what he says here. My, my son, be attentive to wisdom and your ear to my understanding. I'm telling you these things so that you can withhold from these things. Now, if you had to withhold from wickedness, let me say it differently. If it was easy to withhold your path from wickedness, what would be the point of wisdom? So obviously, in his warning here, there's the understanding that it's going to get you, right? Uh -huh. Think of that song, going to get you, get you, get you, get you one way or another. <laughs> and then in verse 3, for the lips of a forbidden woman... Drip honey. Honey is sweet, right? Uh -huh. Something that you want another bite, right? And her speech is smoother than oil. You ever got oil in your oh, hands yeah. and it's real slick? Yeah. Real slick. It traps you and you don't even realize because you get caught up in it. What happens when you're um, in an intimate moment with a person that you know you shouldn't be progressing with? You just overcome with these feelings. You get all sweaty, right? It's like you can't think straight, right? Exactly what he just said here. Oh, no, her <laughs> <laughs> and her speech is smoother than oil. Smoother than oil. So, she uh, sin gives immediate pleasure. That's the first thing. Then it goes down to verses 5 that sin gives lasting pain, though. It immediately goes from the immediate pleasure to the lasting pain. But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. So let's let's break things down here. First, she is bitter as wormwood. So that's what, that's uh, I don't remember exactly what it is. It's a um, oh, yeah. You know, I looked it up too, and I actually forgot. Um, I believe wormwood is an herb. It has a very sour taste, but I don't remember. Uh, 
I can look it up if you guys want, or I can. I move think on. it actually. My Bible has a definition of revelation. Okay, yeah, do that. Oh wait, because that's gonna bother me if I don't say something about <laughs> it. I think uh, my Bible says that uh, gal. Says what? Bitter as gal. G a l l. What translation do you have? An IV. Um, they changed the wording on some stuff to make it uh, simpler to understand. Okay, maybe not. No. No. Grace, where's your iPhone? It's dead. Oh right. What are you looking for? A wormwood. Oh, is it locked? No. Because this is going to be something that, uh, it's going to bug me, guys. Where's your uh, safari? Oh, there it is, Google. I got gotcha. you. Um. What is wormwood? Okay, did you guys get that? What is it? A woody shrub with a bitter aromatic taste used especially formerly as an ingredient of vermouth and absinthe and in medicine. Huh. So, uh, here's that. Um, so, it's, you know, obviously has that bitter taste, but then the same thing that he compares it to sharp as a two-edged sword. Now, the difference between a two-edged sword and another sword is that a two-edged sword is used for piercing, stabbing, okay? Um, it, we talked about this when we looked at Hebrews, remember? The uh, sharp as a double-edged sword, remember? I had thought it's like you can go this way or this way. Oh, I get you. Uh, that's, that would be a one-sided sword because you're swinging at something. But a, d a double-edged sword is made for the purpose of oh. piercing something, stabbing something. Like through. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um... Where was it? Oh, right here. Um, so it's it's the it's the point of like you with your gallbladder, a stabbing pain, something that really gets up in there. <laughs> um, so sin gives lasting pain. And look in verse five. Her feet go down to death. So now we're talking about like the end of your life. Like this is something that's that's dramatic here. Her steps follow the path to Sheol. It leads that way. Follows the path to Sheol. Okay. So. Sin changes the way you think and what you want. Look in verse 6. She does not ponder the path of life. Her ways wander and she does not know it. She is affected by the way that she's walking and the way she's thinking, and she's unaware. She's oblivious. See, so that's really the main, main point of that verse. Sin changes the way you think and what you want. It changes your passions. So the best way to avoid it is to stay far away. Foolish to think you're strong enough to not stay away. It's okay. I can overcome this. Ha ha ha. Look what it says here. And now, O sons, listen to me and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her. It doesn't say become strong enough to be able to dwell next to her without oh. being affected. It says do not keep your way far from her and do not go near the door of her house. Uh, and whenever you guys are done with that, tell me and I'll go to the next one. If you want me to take to take your mind off that pain, I can do something. Give me your toe there. <laughs> Everybody get what they want it written down? A little cold over there, huh? Feels better. I think I'm getting too hot and it's... Oh. Oh, I got you. So, the long-term effects, it has quite a few here, and we'll read them in just a second. A bad name, child support or, support or other court fees... Unforgiving husband, 
position, power, prosperity, it's lost. Um, that last part is an all-encompassing term, position, power, prosperity, lost. Um, so let's go through them here. Um, verse 9, lest you give your honor to others and your years to the merciless, lest strangers take their fill of your strength. Your labors go to the house of a foreigner. At the end of your life you groan when your flesh and body are consumed. So he's going through a lot of different things here. And uh, one of the things to keep in mind is that he's talking about other things that are the result of it. For instance, lest you give your honor to others. In other words, you had a good name and you threw it away because now people know you as the cheater. You're dishonored in front of the community. You're dishonored in front of if you had a spouse or for her husband, either way. Um, and so you re get uh, um, um, dishonor. And then your years to the merciless, trying to repay it to somebody who's not forgiving. Who wouldn't be forgiving in an adulterous situation? Maybe the husband or the wife. See what I mean? <laughs> yes, lest you give your years to the merciless. And here's another thing. Let's say you stay with your spouse. They stay with you, right? They, there's no divorce, right? They will t usually tend to do this. Hold it for the rest of the marriage. And they'll never fully forgive you. They, that doesn't always happen. There can be forgiveness. But a lot of times it will be this. You'll be giving your years to the merciless because your spouse will never forgive you. You'll never have that closeness that you had before. And the rest of your years, years will be spent with this person that will be merciless to you. It won't be the same. It won't be the same. So there's a lot, really a lot of different things he's saying. He's, he's talking here in generalities. So it's hard to give specific instances to everything. Another uh, specific thing is if you're taken to court and you have to do something like play, pay um, child support or something like that, that's, a, that's an ongoing payment where a chunk of, of your earnings is just going away. And the thing with child support is there's nothing that's preventing that money from going to the child. The guardian uses it as they see fit. In other words, they could literally be using that money to, dry, to buy drugs, and you would have no say-so in it. Once again, to the merciless, lest strangers take the fill of your strength, this would be the person who you uh, who you wronged their spouse <laughs> or other people in the situation. Uh, for instance, let's say I, you know, kill somebody, and then the the rest of the family who I don't even know is now seeking vengeance on me, and because of them, I have to spend the rest of my life in prison. I mean, you're still merciless. Let strangers take their fill of your strength, and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. Now, what he means by that is, like for instance, what I said with the child support, where you have an ongoing payment, financial. Thing that comes from you to this other person's house, your labors are going to some, to a foreigner. So here it says there, your labors go to the house of a foreigner. You you work, you get paid, and then that money goes to somebody else. Yeah. <laughs> and at the end of your life, you groan when your flesh and body are consumed. So this is a lasting thing. And then he says there at the end, uh, uh, when your flesh and body are consumed. In other words, you're done. <laughs> you're just exhausted. So what we see there in, in a lot of different ways is it talked about your position being lost, your prosperity being lost, and your power being lost, right? In summation of everything that you were just talking about. So that takes us to there in verse 11 also in the same thing before I move to verse 12. At the end of your life you groan when your flesh and body are consumed. Wisdom is wise past feelings. Lust is hungry. See what I mean? Wise says it doesn't matter what I feel. These are the facts, Right? Like, to be wise in God is to know I can feel like I'm just – that everybody hates me. I can feel that I'm not – you know, that God's ignoring me. I can feel all these things. I'm a bad Christian. I have doubts, all these different things. But wisdom says it doesn't matter what I feel. I know who God is, and I know that I stand by Christ's righteousness and not my own. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? Whereas lust is always hungry. It doesn't – it only pays attention to the feelings of the flesh. See what I mean? So what do we have? I'll give you a perfect example. We live in a society where if a guy feels like a woman, he can get a sex change, which doesn't actually change his sex. It just mutilates his genital, genitals. That's it. D in his DNA, he's still a man. Scientifically, he's still a man. Physically, he's still a man. In his brain, he's still a man. In his soul, he is still a man. The only thing that has changed is the doctor has mutilated his genitals in, to look like the opposite sex's genitals. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's not changing your sex. That's changing your appearance. Uh -huh. See what I mean? That's a big difference there. Um, and then we live in a culture that condones that. Well, he felt like a woman, so he became a woman. No, he felt like a woman, so he mutilated his body. And they're justifying this because why? Lust is hungry. But wisdom is wise past feelings. Does that make sense? Kind of? Uh -huh. Yeah. Yes. yes. So. I'll, and make, make no doubt about it. I and mean, be assured, there will be times in your life when you genuinely want to do something with your whole heart. But just because you genuinely want to do it, genuinely want to do it, doesn't mean that it's wise to do it. Mm -hmm. So all these things could have been avoided. That's why in verse 11 he says, "At the end of your life, you groan." You know, you're talking about guilt here. And then in verse 12 he talks about this. You say, "How I hated discipline, my heart heart despised reproof. I did not listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ear to instructors." In other words, what he's saying is, all these things that that has resulted in my foolishness. Could have been could have been uh, prevented had I simply done had had I simply given my ear to wisdom. See what I mean? And, and what were the sources of wisdom that you mentioned? Discipline, reproof, uh -huh. teachers, yeah. instructors. Yeah. I am at the brink of utter ruin in the assembled congregation. Everyone is looking down on me. Uh -huh. So that takes us to the ninth message, the last message we'll look at for tonight. And that finishes up chapter 5, and it's very simply stated, be faithful to your spouse. <laughs> it's like this. Nothing is forcing you to get married. Nothing is forcing you to get married. There's nobody who's holding a gun, a gun to your head saying you, you need to marry this person. You choose to get married. So with that being said, be faithful to your spouse. You made the commitment to them. Be faithful to it. Well, I'm, I'm a different person. I've changed. They've changed. You made a commitment. That's like saying, but you don't understand. I bought this house 15 years ago. I don't want to pay the next 15 years on it because I don't want the house after all. You took out the loan on the on the house. You you have to you have to pay that. You had to pay that. See what I mean? It's kind of the same kind of a principle. Um, when you make a commitment to your spouse, you made the commitment to your spouse. People do change, absolutely. But don't make a commitment if you don't want to stick to the commitment. I mean, it's that simple. Besides that, if you're willing to abandon your spouse because they're going through something, that's not really making a commitment. If you guys have ever seen the movie Fireproof, he says this comment, you don't leave your partner in a fire. You don't leave your partner in a fire. So it's kind of the same thing. And that's exactly what uh, what adultery is. It's, it's a fire. It's, something, it's a lust that burns in your heart. So... Um, satisfy your passion in your spouse. He never once says, in all of this, he never once says that your passion is wrong. He never says that. But look what he says to do with that passion. Drink water from your own cistern. That would be basically, you could say it differently. Have sex with your own spouse. Flowing water from your own well. See how, how positively he talks about your spouse? Flowing water from your own will. It's a flowing water. He doesn't talk about it like it's this this water that's all gross and has floaties in it. Water from your own, flowing water from your own well. Then verse 16. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water uh, in the streets? See, he turned the he he turned the corner. He's talking about hey you don't cheat on your spouse. But then what is he using as as an example? He uses what if your spouse did that? What if they did it to you? See that? Look what you just said. Should your springs be scattered abroad? Streams of water in the streets? Should they just float around? Well, you wouldn't like that, would you? So why should you do that to your partner? See what I mean? Jesus said it like this. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. Let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. Let's, let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. Let her be blessed. Now what does that mean? You bless her. What does that mean? You bless your spouse. Let her be blessed by who? By you. <laughs> don't curse your don't curse your spouse and complain about them all the time. Give them words of encouragement. Lift them up. Enjoy them as a person. Bless them. Ask yourself this: Is their life better by them marrying me or worse than, than by them marrying me? Because a lot of times people just try to be the biggest pain in the butt to their spouse that they can be. So were you gonna say something? Look like you had. Oh, okay. Uh, and rejoice in the wife of your youth. Why he says that is because sometimes 
especially men. I don't know if women struggle with this because I'm not a woman. But uh, a lot of times men will do this. They'll marry someone in, in, when, in their younger days, and then they'll find reasons to divorce them as they get older and stuff. You know what I mean? You guys know what I'm talking about? Because guys, guys are all about the next best model. A newer mower comes out, and they're like, oh, man, I, I, that mower is more better than my mower, even though they both do the same thing. They see a, a more attractive or younger wife either way. I want that one. See what I mean? And they, they get in this mentality of switching things out. You know, I, this car is five years old. I need the new model. <laughs> you see what I mean? They get in this mindset. And uh, rejoice in the wife of your youth. Even when you're old and you're both crazy and ugly and wrinkly, rejoice in the wife of your youth. <laughs> so, um, and let me say this. Looks matter less the older you get. Don't ruin the life partnership that you could have formed by striving after something better. Sex is for married people, one man and one woman. Look, where, look how he talks about this in here. Your springs be scattered, broad streams of water. He just said it in here, you should be having sex only with your spouse. You, the same as you don't want your spouse having sex with all kinds of people, you shouldn't be. That also seems to imply... That we shouldn't have multiple spouses, doesn't it? Because how could we have it be for ourselves alone if we're already not for our spouse alone? See what I mean? Genesis records people having multiple wives, but it never condones them having multiple wives. There's a difference. Yeah. It records a lot of things, immoral things that people were doing. It doesn't mean that it condones everything that, that it records. Give your spouse compliments and blessings. Look in verse 18. Let... Your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. If you're rejoicing, that's something that they're going to be able to see, right? So, lust is earned only by a spouse, and God always sees what you're doing. Look at this, verses 20. Um, I'm sorry, let's read through 19 because I think I skipped yeah. past that. A lovely deer, a graceful doe, let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love, in her love. Be intoxicated always in her love. And I think I already said everything there that I that it's saying, so I don't really want to belabor a point. Verse 20 then. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? Why should you cheat on your wife or husband? Either or. Why should you do this thing with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? For a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his past. So not only should you not do it because you wouldn't want them to do it to you. Not only should you not do it because there's really no logical reason to do it. Right. If you're going to do that, you might as well just divorce them and get it over with. There's no reason to drag them through the mud for something when you had no no intention of staying faithful. And if you had no intention, intention to stay faithful, don't marry them in the first place. Yeah. It's, it's a really a simple, a simple conclusion here. <laughs> so, uh, but even if all that... But then there's also this last reason that he throws in there, just in case none of those reasons were good enough for you. A man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his past. God ponders all of your past. That's a scary thought. Yeah. <laughs> that means you can't possibly excuse your adultery. And then uh, Peter talks about this later when he says that God will not answer your prayers if you mistreat your spouse. Exactly what he's saying here just elaborates on a different area that it applies on. Um, and then, okay, so I said verse 20 and 21. Okay. So then, uh, sin causes physical and spiritual, immediate and long-term results. So it just all around screws you. Look at verse 22. The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him. The bad thing that, thing that he's doing, it, it ensnares him, and he is held fast to the cords of his sin. He dies for lack of discipline, and because of his great folly, he is led astray. So we see here... Physical and spiritual effects, we see immediate and long-term results. It is all around a destructive thing, not to let it in, not to let it in you. And that finishes up chapter five. But just listen to what he says there: the iniquities of the wicked ensnare him. Think of it like this: you rob a bank, and then you get caught for robbing the bank, so you go to jail. Why? What was his sin? His sin was lust and greed. See how that works? The sins are ensnaring him. The very thing that he's giving himself over to has taken its toll. So, And it obviously results in death. There will always be someone else out there that revs your engine. Move on. I just had that little note written to the side. There's always going to be someone out there that revs your engine. 
Always going to happen. Especially after you've been married for about 10 or 15 years. <laughs> but move on. You don't have to... You don't have to say, okay, um, this next person revs my engine, so farewell, see ya. Well, that's just because there's someone new. It doesn't mean that there's someone better. In fact, if you learn anything from this, what he thinks, what, he's, what he says here is compare. Always compare. You're, you're, you're looking at the good sides of your sin, uh, of the blessings that it's going to give you. Be realistic here. These are the effects that's going to come out of that. This is what you're going to lose. This is the this is how it's going to negatively affect you. Compare and be honest. Oh well, if I get with them, I'll be happy. No, you won't. You won't. You won't be happy at all. You'll lose your partner. Your name will go down in reproach. You have all these problems. You'll have court cases. You'll have this and that and the other thing. I mean, there's so many. Th see, I mean, there's so many things where even if you didn't love your love your spouse, which let's hope you do, even if you didn't, there's ample reason to not not uh, cheat on them just because there's so many reasons. So, anyways, any questions on that? You're staring at me very intently. You all right? Yeah. Any questions? Okay. Uh, Yams next week is canceled because of the revival services. We will resume the first Tuesday of what? Yeah. Where are we in? We're in April. Yes. Wow. Wow. Uh, so I guess that'd be May, I guess. Wow. So, if there are no questions or comments, we're gonna go ahead and stop the recording.